the purple dusk of twilight time steals across the meadows of my heart. High up in the sky, the little stars climb, always. I was born in 1942 in Baldwin, Long Island. My father was serving in the Navy during my infant years. I had an older sister, Louise, who was the best athlete on the block. My childhood was ordinary with the exception of my physique. I was always skinny and taller than most of my classmates. People would ask me if I was a basketball player or comment on my long fingers saying I would make a good piano player. I also had a deformity of my chest that made me very self-conscious. It was not until 40 years later that I discovered I had Marfan syndrome. We had uh, been invited to uh, a surprise birthday party. Patton and I knew Ray through going to De Janeiro's and listening to Poggy Bottom and of course, we knew Judy, but it was at the early stage of our friendship. And I don't believe that uh, I had met the, the boys yet. And when we went to the birthday party, everyone was having a good time. And I was just struck looking at, at their oldest son, Richie, and his body type. Uh, I, I'd, uh, you know, in dental school, you're introduced to all sorts of diseases. You don't become really conversant in them, but the one thing that I was impressed upon is I always talked about feeling that Abraham Lincoln had had Marfan syndrome because of his long, lanky nature and his slender fingers. And while I recognized that in Ray, it never really connected to me. I just thought he was a skinny, tall man. When I saw Richie, for some reason, it just came to the front of my mind, uh, not only his body type, uh, but it was almost as though a bell went off and it was like, you're looking at someone with Marfans. This is one of those diseases you never thought you would ever see. Uh, for a while there, yeah, when I first heard out I had Marfans, I thought, you know, I was really upset about it. But by the fact that my evaluations didn't show much change in my aorta over a number of years, I started getting complacent that, uh, you know, maybe it wouldn't rupture, maybe I wouldn't, you know, it would stay within a safe range. At the same time, you know, Rich had an aortic uh, aneurysm and, and, you know, almost died from that. And so in fact, he's so lucky he's alive. So what's going on with me right now after getting the CAT scan, uh, they wanted me to do that to get a more accurate measure than an echocardiogram could do. And I figured, well, it would be, you know, pretty close to the same, maybe even smaller, but when it showed a, you know, fairly large increase in a short period, now I realize that, you know, it's back and we're staring me right in the face again, that, uh, you know, you have a sense of your own mortality. So as a filmmaker, uh, what I want to do is uh, uh, capture as much of my thoughts during this period when I have a, examining my life, examining mortality, uh, you know, kind of figuring things out, knowing that, well, your life is going to change somehow after this event, and you're going to find out in, on July 18th what that you know, best guess is, and you got to prepare for it. So this timing of events is, has caused me to look at my life much more introspectively than I've ever done before. Let's have four messages. Hello, uh, Dr. Cameron calling from Johns Hopkins Wednesday morning, and uh, I uh, just wanted to let you know I'm going to be in the operating room this morning a little bit longer than expected, so there may be a little bit of a delay in our meeting. Your heart is about that size. It's a muscle that squeezes and pumps blood out to the body through this blood vessel called the aorta. The aorta turns around in the upper part of the chest, it goes down in the back, mm -hmm. and it has branches that supply blood to all of the other parts of the body. 
Now, the heart pumps blood out to the body. It also pumps blood back to itself through these little blood vessels on the surface of the heart called the coronary arteries. When you hear about people having heart attacks or bypass surgery, That's, it means okay. they've had blockages here. But we don't believe there's any problem there with, with you. Okay. What we are concerned about is that the aorta here at the bottom, just the first inch and a half or two inches of it, is a bit enlarged, and that's that's typical of a lot of people who have Marfan syndrome. There's a weakness in this area that causes the aorta to dilate out, and when it becomes uh, dilated, we call it an aneurysm. It's a particular kind of aneurysm. It's an aortic root aneurysm, and unfortunately, if they get too big, the tension in the wall goes up, and the aortic can rupture, and that's of course what happened to uh, your son. Yes. Uh, that uh, uh, actually a tear developed on the inside lining. Uh, the tear is something called a dissection, and it can lead to rupture. Um, and in some people, it just ruptures right away. And uh, all of these are bad things. You never want to let this happen. Your son was very lucky that he uh, managed to get to the hospital and have this fixed. In general, we think it's much better, though, to prevent that from happening by doing an operation that replaces the aorta with a plastic tube that's made of Dacron. And, uh, and then the question always comes up, what to do about the valve? There's a valve here at the bottom which opens and closes to let blood leave the heart. It's called the aortic valve. In some people it's leaking a lot and we have to replace it. Uh, your valve is working fine and one of the questions would be whether we should try to keep that valve. Um, because there are certain advantages to keeping your own valve and not having an artificial valve. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The, the real question is, when should one do an operation like this? And we have some general guidelines about this that relate mainly to the size of the aorta and what we believe is the risk of it rupturing as it relates to the size. Excuse me. The aorta uh, is is normally about about three centimeters, a little over an inch, and yours is up uh, closer to about four and a half uh, centimeters. This uh, we've measured it in different areas here, and 4.6 is the is the measurement that we have here on this CT scan. And generally, we uh, for years said that you should consider having this operation to replace the aorta if it gets to be about five and a half or 5.5 centimeters. Um, and the operation to replace it usually meant replacing the valve too, but that, as I say, has changed. Now, what we've learned though is that when there is a family history mm -hmm. of a rupture or a dissection, that it may be better to replace the aorta a little earlier and not let it get to be 5.5. Uh, and so, most doctors would recommend five centimeters as the threshold for having this surgery. Five. Yeah. Five centimeters. Yeah. There are even some people who say it should be less than that, mm. uh, particularly if you're interested in an operation to save the valve, because the, the more stretched out it is, the less likely that we can save the valve. The operation, when it's done as, a, as an elective operation, unlike your son's operation, which was an emergency, as an elective operation, it's, it's gone very well. It's usually a pretty smooth four-hour operation where you're in the hospital for about a week. And the risks, uh, at least with our experience, have been extremely low. Um, really, a one in a hundred chance of a serious problem, probably less. Mm. In fact, all of the patients who've had this surgery here have survived the surgery, but I think we've been lucky, too. Okay. And I, I would say there's a one in a hundred chance of a serious problem. I got this strange jolt through my chest, which kind of electric jolt, but it didn't hurt. It just was this weird sensation kind of shoot through me for a split second. On Monday, I woke up and felt no problems at all. I felt fine. So I went into work like normal. And as the workday progressed, I started getting that sensation back. But then I started getting a pain in my right or left shoulder. And then slowly I could notice my breathing was getting a little bit harder to breathe and I had to breathe deeper to get, get air. And then I, I knew at that point I need, I need to go to the hospital. And the, well, the doctor came in, the surgeon said that you're gonna need immediate open heart surgery. And I'm pretty much at this point like, you do what you gotta do. 
and he told me it was a aortic dissection that I am luckily I'm still alive but luckily I was stable enough where he had this option where they could do they'd have to uh, do heart surgery or they'd have to put in an artificial valve and replace part of my aortic arch and he said they could do it there but he also said the best doctors are in Johns Hopkins up in Baltimore. Pretty much next thing I know I'm on a helicopter uh, jet helicopter and get up to Baltimore from Winchester that's where I was at Winchester Medical when I went to the ER and so within a few hours they um, shipped me up to John Hopkins. My friend Carl Moons has been helping me on some of my productions when Judy isn't able to join me. It always is great to have a sidekick to go on the road with. We're on our way to Nashville to work on a film called Big Jim Calvin when we took a side trip to Smoke Oak Canyon in Pendleton County, West Virginia. Beautiful state, West Virginia, I'll tell you. I hate to leave it and this is all new for me. I've never seen this part before. It'll be really worth it. I'll bring Judy up here. Yeah. In the fall. Oh, this is gorgeous, oh, man. So, Ray, what I'm worried about is uh, you changing after we, if you take this surgery on your heart. I worry about this <laughs> because will we be able to do this again? Will you be the same person, you know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Come on and break my heart. Come on and break my heart again. Lay your tasseled head upon my One of the things I always enjoyed when going to Sutton, West Virginia, was stopping at my friends Kevin and Doreen Carpenter. Kevin is also a filmmaker and would always stay up late at night talking about filmmaking on his front porch overlooking the Elk River or explore ideas around the kitchen table or living room. Kevin has worked with me on a couple of productions including Beautiful You about a talented young Chinese sculptor named Achu Hopen who lives down the road from him. I wanted to tell Kevin and his wife Doreen about my latest idea for my film Six Months and to elicit his support if for some reason I cannot finish the production myself. We started what? talking about all, he's filmed maybe seven or eight people. He's filmed seven or eight people's lives. And I sat down and I said to him, Ray's life is, is more interesting than any of those people that he, he filmed. He was a, a bluegrass musician Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a PhD analyst for presidents and Congress <laughs> introduced this big legislation and then became an independent filmmaker. You know, struggling filmmakers and we're out here right now on a shoot, you know, to go to Nashville for another movie. So we're making movies within movies, all that, and bringing all the stories, every personal stories, and meeting all the people in my life who are very important to me right now. I want to I know document you as a friend, that experience of uncertainty and, and mortality, but not really worrying about it, but at the same time, you want to make a good film. <laughs> <laughs> and he has never had any complications, but he said, you know, and, but he said, we're lucky. So he wanted to give some sense of risk, you know, just a ballpark. I guess that's all I was kind of thinking of. And he was said there, there, and he didn't say death, but it's implicit in the statement, you know. But he let me videotape it. Yeah, this is what this is. What I got he's, got I got he's got the camera. On this guy, right? So finally, he's I said, like, Dr. Oh, Kiss, there's a lawsuit waiting to happen here, you know. <laughs> well, they do matter of factly, but the risk is like one in a hundred that there'll be some serious problems. So it's not really the risk. I'm not worried about the risk. Per se. You know, that's not really the risk because I don't like the idea of three months of this. Yeah, yeah. It takes, he told me three months to recuperate. But he said, but you can go back to what you're doing. Implicit in that statement was, you know, he knows I'm a filmmaker and that I can still do this kind of stuff. But you may not be able to. But you may not be creative anymore. You may be a, a recluse. Right. You never know. That's what I'm thinking. we got to watch him. It's a time. horror show. It's a yeah. horror movie. Yeah, they, they saved the guy's life, but now, you know, ooh. <laughs>
<laughs> the end of the movie is, so, what are you going to be like? Well, the thing is, the movie's mm -hmm. going to end in six months, literally. And it's going to end when I get the results of my latest uh, echocardiogram. And if you die, this is going to be a great flick. <laughs> oh, it's even right. No, that's exactly right. That no, is the only, that's the only way I'll get any recognition. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> While I was in Sutton, I visited with Melanie Davis. I first met her when she was in a production I filmed called For the Love of Theater. One thing Melanie told me that really stuck with me was that she was happy with her life in the small town of Sutton. She had everything she needed there. Melanie was not chasing stardom in New York or L.A. This mindset wore off on me. As a filmmaker, I decided I could find more contentment and happiness doing what I was doing as a small independent filmmaker rather than trying to attain something bigger and more elusive. It's just good to be happy where you are. If your needs are met, then you shouldn't have to be seeking something higher. She also shared a personal health issue with me that affected her life. Let me stop this a second. We're stuck rushing this, aren't we? I'm always rushing. <laughs> Should I stop? Or is there something you want to say while I have this running? No, there's nothing I want to say. I just didn't know what we were going to talk about, you know, entirely. Oh, I don't either. Oh, it was the mortality bit, but uh, we already talked about it. I need you to talk about your heart. You know, when I was... About my heart yeah, surgery. Ooh, let me... I started having chest pains, and it was so crazy because I was young, and the doctors just gave me antacids and sent me home, and it got progressively worse. And it was just superventricular tachycardia. It's a problem with your heart misfires, and they have to go in and burn the inside of your heart, and I was so scared, and they took my license and everything. But in doing the work, the problem was, they tell you, you know, we're going to be messing with your heart, there's major risks, I was so scared, and then they had me in the operating room awake. They were going to do it while I was awake because they do it with wires. They just go through all your veins, but if you move, then you have to have a pacemaker. So uh, they had to knock me out, and then they have to stop everything. Well, that's scary, but... But it doesn't change you. It doesn't change your personality to have... Uh, I hope so. I know you're concerned. I'm doing a personal film, Steve. I'm doing a personal, uh, it's a personal film, I'm going to let Carl explain the whole concept and then I want to get some of your thoughts about it, okay? okay. did you get, the thing with him is, you know, he has that Marfan syndrome. Yeah. And his uh, aorta yeah, is, is expanding. So, yeah, and uh, and we got to talking about this and the first, the first thing this came up with is that he's been filming a whole lot of different people, artists. So, we, I said, I said, think about this, you, he is more interesting than anybody he's ever filmed. Here he is, retired and, and becoming a filmmaker, independent filmmaker of the year in, Virgi in uh, West Virginia. Yeah. So I said, man, how many people have had that kind of a background? And he's making a movie on himself. Right. And, and then the other issue came up was that when they go in and do this to him, they basically kill him for a split second if they're going to do this because oh, they stop his heart. The, yeah. the aorta. They yeah. stop his heart. Ooh. and put him on a machine and you know and all the rest of it and I said well you've heard the story about Dick Cheney you know the president the vice president they a lot of people have said and I've read stories about this before he had that open-heart surgery he was a different person oh, they said really? he was a lot more compassionate a lot more interesting guy and afterwards you know he's like he is now they sort of the yeah. Darth Vader or yeah. something there is this incredible drama of everybody's life and of course Ray has that to the maximum that uh, he's made all these films about everybody else's conditions but finally now he's looking in the mirror and saying hey I tell people I know that every day could be my last and that's the gift of my great tragedy in particular my sister died when I was third when she was 13 I was in second grade and I've known ever since then that that next day could be my last day I'll come down with double pneumonia like she did when she was 13 and be dead by that w that weekend which happened to her so uh, both of my living siblings older siblings have had cancer uh, and uh, one when she was only 20 years old and she's had to survive that and then my 
older brother died from stomach cancer having, after having it for 20 years, beating it three times. So I know that the genetics are there and uh, it's up to me to enjoy. I tell people like Nietzsche, I performed as Nietzsche as a living philosopher, that every day there's an, uh, is heaven or hell and it's up to me to make it that. Uh, that uh, you have no control over the universe except your own universe and you should appreciate you know the moments that you have every day and like I tell my dog uh, every day with Sierra is a wonderful day because it's great to be around a creature that loves you <laughs> and uh, so I tell my wife if I die tomorrow I'm an extremely happy man We left Charleston and headed for Nashville, Tennessee to finish up work on our film, Big Jim Calvin. Jim was a musical string wizard with a molasses baritone, a teller of tales, humorous, actor, instrument collector, and composer. We were working with his widow, Nan Calloway, on a film on Jim's life, following his musical journey from California to Jalisco, Mexico, and then to Nashville. Carl and I arrived in Guthrie, Kentucky, which sits right on the Kentucky-Tennessee border. Guthrie was a wide open railroad town ringed by tobacco fields. People would go drinking in Tennessee and gambling in Kentucky. Now it is like many other towns of the back country south and had a major racial problem a number of years ago with a killing over a rebel flag. It was also the home of Robert Penn Warren, the first poet laureate at the Library of Congress, the place I worked at for 25 years. We stopped for breakfast at the American Cafe where country cooking makes you good looking. Carl struck up a conversation with some of the regulars and asked anyone if they knew of Jim Calvin or where he lived. While they didn't know of Jim Calvin, we got general directions to a former bar down the road known as the Miami Gardens. On the way to the Miami Gardens, we passed a funky garage that made barbecue grills and smokers out of just about anything. Carl wanted to stop and look around and ask if anyone knew of Jim Calvin. He just happened to drop in one day. Uh, he was driving that old, uh, his pickup truck, okay. that old Dodge. And, the, the, the fixed up one with yeah, the pipes? Yeah, the red one. Oh, yeah. And uh, I think he met Dallas one of the restaurants or something, you know. Dallas would come out of the shop and he'd come down here. Next thing you know, boy, he spoke a little rope with us and we'd pick and sing. And, <laughs> oh, you, you know, pick it? You do I don't, oh, but, but he does. Yeah, yeah. The restaurant is a Mexican restaurant. Uh, Jim played up there one night, so we all went up there to listen to him. He did a good job. He had a good turnout, boy. Food was terrible, <laughs> but uh, he was great. <laughs> Four years ago, I made that one. Jim and Ann Calvin lived in a roadhouse that had once been a racist biker bar, mentioned in Tony Horowitz's Pulitzer Prize winning book, Confederates in the Attic. When we entered, it was like stepping into a virtual country music museum, jam-packed with all of Jim's vintage instrument collection and Nashville memorabilia. Nan made arrangements for us to go out on her best friend Penny's boat for an interview. Penny was very close to Jim and was with him when he received word that he had terminal lung cancer. According to Nan, she could channel Jim. I'm with you, Nan, right now. Okay? I'm trusting Jim. Oh, there's the motel, Carl. Uh, Say goodbye. Bye-bye, motel. Say goodbye. What a dump. This has been the funkiest time I've had in my life. Uh, tell, no, tell me, how did, what happened out last night? Okay, so... Well, last I, night there... I 
after I left you, I went in my room <clears throat> and the music, I heard music, loud, boom, 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 bass, and, uh, and I heard all this talking like a party was going on. It's right on the other side of the wall. That happened to be the office for the motel. I'm thinking, what, what are they doing over there? So I went outside and I banged on the window, uh, their window, because the office is closed. And this guy gets up and looks out the window and I point to my ears, you know, hey, cut the noise, you know. Go back in the room, nothing, nothing changes. In fact, it might even have gotten a little louder. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, I'm paying $50 a night for this to listen to some party. And uh, I go around to the front of the office and that little blonde German girl comes out. Turns out she owns a place. She owns a place. And she owns a place. And that melon head she's with is her boyfriend, oh, God. Darren. <laughs> And uh, she looked a little like she'd been drinking or stoned or I don't know what, but... So I said, please, you know, I, I need to drive tomorrow. I need some sleep. And she said, okay, okay, we'll turn it down. We'll turn it down. You know, so... So I go back to my room, nothing. <laughs> Still music, noise. So I turn around, finally I get so mad, I turn around and I bang the wall with my fist. <laughs> and I hear... <laughs> The wall goes, wham! You know? <laughs> and he was sitting, I could see through the window when I went there, he was sitting right on the other side of the wall. <laughs> so, all of a sudden, bam! He hits the wall. The wall almost moves, and I heard some stuff fall down. And <laughs> then he hit it again. <laughs> and I yelled, God damn it! <laughs> and he starts yelling, God, fuck you! you know? <laughs> Well, he's the management, so of, the the management of the motel. Oh <laughs> God, this is terrible. Oh Carl, uh, I don't know what happened to you. you I know? finally, he finally called me on the phone and yelled at me and hung up. Uh, said, said, I said I need some sleep. He said, "You come here, I'll put you to sleep." Oh my God, really? <laughs> oh. I'm thinking oh, I'm gonna go kick his ass. <laughs> <laughs> I decided to take Judy for a getaway weekend to celebrate her birthday. We stayed at the newly refurbished Stonewall Jackson Hotel in Stanton, Virginia. We hooked up with my college friend and former bandmate Bill Page, who lived in nearby Lexington, Virginia. Bill had his own health issue to contend with. And here comes Judy. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Judy. Happy birthday to you. I hope it wasn't too flat. You look beautiful. Yes. And what's so cool, we're going to see our friend Bill Page. Bill and I are college buddies. He was in a different fraternity, of course. But we played together in the band, the Catalinas, and had some great times. So after we go down to the lobby and meet him, We'll let everybody meet Bill Page and talk about 1960s when we had the Catalinas and the basement tapes and all the rock and roll bands. So this should be a lot of fun. Anyway, we're having a great time, aren't we, honey? And we met all kinds of people already in the bar at the uh, Mill, what is it called? The Mill Street or Mill Street Grill? Stone. Great place. What is it called? Mill Stone, I think. Mill Stone? Well, we'll find out. Okay, <laughs> let's go on downstairs now. She wasn't kidding, Bill. I'm making yeah. a movie of my life and you're in it. What will happen to me? Will I change? Will my whole ma mindset change? Will my emotions change? Because my little, little uh, humor thing is that people used to say that Dick Cheney was a good guy before he had open heart surgery. So even though... <laughs> I don't mean to laugh. That makes me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's very valid because you okay. just don't know. 
Do you well, know? No, they're going to turn everything off. They're going to fix it, and then they're going to bring everything back up. And everything doesn't necessarily come back up the same way it left. You know, things change. Now, I had cancer four years ago, and they got it, and it has not been back. But I, I have a checkup December or September 25th. You know, that's my end of my six-month rope. And you just don't know. You know, um, I don't think it's I don't think it's going to come back. I really don't. But who knows? You know. But there's a sense of anxiety involved. I mean, you can't help but thinking about it once in a while. It's not anxiety, but it's just uh -huh. you know, if it were to return, it is going to dramatically change my life. Um, you know, I, I I take a whole different path in the road. Um, but I, I don't think it's going to return. But nevertheless. You gotta go for your checkup, and you you know, and they give you an immediate feedback. You know, it's um, you know, and then you get six more months of rope. <laughs> you know what I want to try to do, and it sounds kind of I don't spend enough time trying to do it, but there's a lot. I'm trying to almost freeze the growth of my aorta by trying to focus on through consciousness trying to heal or to help my heart through a more absolutely abs that's what I guess that's what's happened for me in the last 10 or 15 years of my life is coming to the realization of the power of all that stuff about your mind not just positive but 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 programming and I mean, you'll hear somebody say, boy, it's really going to be a bad day today. Well, guess what? It is. Your attitude says, I'm looking for a bad day today. So you'll find a bad day. If the same attitude is, look at my blessings. Look at all the things that I have to be thankful for. And, and I'm going to visualize myself with, you know, healthy veins and arteries that are, that are, completely up to the task and are, are growing and are strong, your body will create that. I just, I have been studying this stuff for 10 years. So many people go to prayer, to prayer like prayer groups for themselves or prayer. Sure. Because they believe prayer works, it does. But scientific studies show that they really doesn't do, you know, I mean, they had a major study on prayer. It was very disappointing to people who are believers. They're going to continue to believe that prayer does work. But there was a major federally funded study on, on prayer, and they could not, with like remote prayer and all that, and it didn't have any effect. And that was very disappointing. I, I don't, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm not, I'm not religious. But I believe that prayer works, absolutely. I think prayer works for anyone who believes that prayer works. Safe travel back, guys. <laughs> Take care. Hey, Bill, bye. Every year for the past 39 years, my college fraternity brothers get together for a golf outing. We go to various places around the country. One year we went to Bermuda. This year the reunion was held in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It was always good to see old friends. While sitting around poolside at the Serendipity Bed and Breakfast, I found out that two of my fraternity brothers had both recently had open heart surgery and I wanted to talk with them. They both had been to the place that I might venture. But about a week after surgery, I went into a very, very, very deep depression. And I had no idea what it was. I, I had no idea what depression was. I never thought depression. Consequently, I had no way of combating it. But very confused. He had a lot of confusion in the hospital. I had a wasn't tough time sure with why he was there, yeah. but that was anesthetic. If I could, while I was laying in that hospital bed being depressed, if I could have found a knife, a stiletto, a scalpel, I would have happily stuck myself, sliced my throat or wrist. I would have done away with myself. 
and I'd have been very happy to, because that can't hurt that much. And the doctor kept saying to me, take him home. That'll go away, that confusion, once he gets in his own surroundings. I thought I was in the Civil War, <laughs> serving under Abe Lincoln. Yeah. And every morning I get up, I get out of bed, no sweat, I stand up erect and I give the condition of my troops. How many I lost through the night, how many were injured. Yeah. I, I sat down at times trying to write letters to the parents and the wives of the deceased. It was a very, very real, frightening thing. Had I been forewarned about the depression, I would have more readily been able to identify it and deal with it if I knew it was a common thing. I, I've done some reading and some, some talk with other people about the depression of it. And the depression, it seems, is caused by the heart-lung machine. When they put you on the heart-lung machine, essentially they're killing you for a couple hours. Well, I was talking with Truxel about about his uh, recovery from his heart surgery. He was very, you know, got into a real depression. And uh, how did it all work with you? I didn't realize you had a heart surgery. Well, Ray, I'll tell you what. My heart surgery went according to plan. Uh, I think if you get depressed, it's part of your own ball game. I never did. Uh, it went very well. I was lucky. It caught me in the right time. Uh, I had everything repaired. I'm back to normal. Everything is good. Life is good. Don't get depressed. Just go with the program and everything will work out. There's a book, uh, the title of which is uh, Chasing Daylight. The author, I've forgotten his first name, but it's something Irish because his last name is O'Kelly. O apostrophe Kelly. And uh, he was a CEO of one of the largest accounting firms on earth at 20,000 employees. At 52, he was on the, he was on the, he was a workaholic, but he also a family holic. He did a lot with, he was on, constantly on the go. His family and business. He got terminal brain cancer, he had six months to live at the age of 52. And his first, he was in shock. Uh, but a man with an uh, analytical mind, that uh, you can't be a CPA and not have an analytical mind, uh, he took upon himself to write a book. And he wrote a book, and it's six months he had to live, he wrote a book chronicling what he did to finish out his life, how he, he uh, said goodbye to his family, his friends, he made a list of people that he'd known years and years ago, but he wanted to say goodbye to them. And he did all this thing and described, I found it very inspirational that a guy that, uh, that had a multimillionaire, everything in the world, and gave a great part of his last six months to other people, including his family. AH here, West Virginia filmmakers have a film fest in Sutton where we can screen our productions, socialize, and get rejuvenated. Carl and I ran into Jesse Johnson, who is not only a filmmaker, but was running for the U.S. Senate seat held by the Venerable Robert Byrd as a candidate of the Mountain Party. Carl posed the question we have been asking others. Ray has Marfan syndrome, such that the aorta coming out of his heart, you know, uh, if it gets any bigger, they're gonna do preventive surgery. They're gonna, you know, slice him open. Right. At one point in there, they stop his heart, so he's dead. Right. We're arguing whether or not you think his personality is gonna change. Right. <laughs> Chaney. I don't think that he was ever a decent guy. <laughs> not, I'm not saying that there couldn't be a change in personality. When, whenever you start, because, and, and I say that because I've known people who have had transplants and things like that who've had profound changes mm -hmm. in, in their uh, consciousness, their beliefs, their, their memories, their, uh, you know, their feelings, etc. But, you know, there's, more, there's always more, you know, what do they say, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Um, so... Ray. It's a wrap. <laughs> Ray's a pussycat. <laughs> I love Ray. I had just screened both Beautiful You and For the Love of Theater at the Film Fest. I was elated when the latter received the People's Choice Award. We went to the party held at the lobby of the Oak Hotel that night. 
Elaine Wine gave the most incredible performance. Tears streamed down my face when she sang the title song she wrote for my film, Beautiful You. I didn't find out until after her performance that she had a cancerous lump removed from her breast just several days earlier. For the past 32 years, Judy and I have been hosting an annual Oktoberfest at our farm in Matthias. It is a great way to see friends we have known over the years and to meet new ones. What started this out was this whole idea that uh, I might have to have heart surgery. And if I did have heart surgery, would that affect me emotionally? Would I be able to continue to do filmmaking, which is a love and a passion? I'll tell you a very personal story that my dad told me when my younger sister was born with cerebral palsy and he was devastated. He had two healthy children and then the third child ends up with a very terrible mental and physical disability and they had just built a cerebral palsy center in Roosevelt, Long Island and he went when she was one year old and diagnosed he went there to meet other parents and to hear what they were going through and to meet the children and everything. And when he came out of that meeting, he said he felt like he was the luckiest guy in the world because he saw how many other parents were struggling with so many more problems than he was facing, that they either didn't have the financial ability to deal with the handicap or their child were much, children were much more handicapped or they had a dysfunctional family who wasn't able to encapsulate and encircle the handicapped child and give them love. And he walked out of a meeting that most people would have been devastated by realizing what had befallen him. And he devoted his life to this charity. And the fact that he was able to have that positive vision when something so devastating had been befallen him was an attitude that he's always shown me throughout my entire life and I feel like I've lived through that philosophy and um, it's uh, you know it helps me get through each and every day because I always whenever I get down and depressed I always look at other people and I realize how lucky I am and how could I let myself get into this depressed state? Look at what other people all over the world are facing mm -hmm. and how fortunate and lucky I am. No matter what you're going through, just look around. And I think if you do, you can't help but thank God every minute for what you do have. And this life of ours is very, very fleeting. Yeah. And you don't n never know when it's going to pass you by and what tomorrow's going to bring. And today may be the very last day of your life so why not in make the most of it and not let things upset you and not ponder what if this happens and what if that happens if it happens you'll deal with it if it doesn't happen it's just wasted energy there's just no benefit in worrying and and ruining the moment the moment is so precious you're worrying about something that might happen maybe it won't happen Maybe your aorta will stay whatever the size it is and you'll live your life till your grand old age. Don't ponder and worry. It's wasted energy. It doesn't help. If it happens, it happens. There's nothing you could do to help. I ran into Tom Reed at our local restaurant. I told him about the personal film I was doing and how I was examining my life in six-month increments. He said he was doing the same thing, but with a different part of his body. But when they told me I had cancer, then I really had to think about it, and I was unhappy. But in the meantime, I was going to fill up my life with as much of, of Tom Reed as I possibly could. I'm not expecting any imminent demise, but uh, the doctors have said, you know, I got it, I've got prostate cancer. But if we manage it pr properly, 
I can have a biopsy every six months. And so I wind up living my life in, uh, in six month increments. I get a biopsy, I get a PSA test every couple of months even in between that. And uh, depending on what the uh, doctors tell me, that's how I live my life. My son Rich lives in Winchester, Virginia and spent the Christmas holiday with us. Ever since I had conceived this film project, I wanted to ask him personal questions regarding what he experienced when he had emergency heart surgery, but was always reluctant to do so. Finally, with the end of my six month filming period coming to a close, it was time to ask him what he went through and how open heart surgery affected his life. Recovery is a little tough uh, having your, um, the, your, your bones get <laughs> healing right there. The, getting that sternum cracked open, was, that was probably the toughest part, um, getting over the recovery. But within three months, I was back at work. And uh, yeah, I'm on uh, blood thinners, and I have a ticking in my chest. If it's quiet, you can hear it. But yeah, it, was, it, was, it, uh, it makes you appreciate life more being that close, because the doctor is saying, 90% of the people that had the, the extent of that this section that I had would have been dead within, you know, you know, hours. And I, I don't know if when I first felt that jolt if that was right when it happened, but it was several days. So, uh, you know, I'm really lucky to be here. So. How would you reply to what Carl, Carl talks about that uh, he feels that I, I would be changed? Well, I, I think it depends. Every person, it's different yeah. for every person. I think it also depends on what type of surgery, the extent of how serious or how soon you know you have to have surgery, or like if it's something that you have to think about for a long time. Like with me, it was so sudden and it was so life or death that it had to happen right away. It didn't give me time to really ponder things. I feel great. I look at it that I got a second lease on life. So every day is just a bonus. Every day is, you know, that extra, extra time that, that I easily wouldn't have. I never got depressed, even when I was in the hospital and even though when I was in relative, I wasn't in too much pain, but the pain of getting out of, in and out of bed when I was waiting for my chest to heal, I, I still, part of it might've been, you know, me being a little younger that I was upbeat and like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna get better and, you know, the hard part's out of the way. Yeah. And I, I never never got depressed, even though when I was laid up in bed for weeks, like I said, I always look back and say, I'm lucky I'm still here. The time arrived when I was to have my echocardiogram. This was going to be a day of reckoning in which I was preparing myself for. The echocardiogram was to be performed in nearby Harrisonburg, Virginia with the results sent to our family physician and to Dr. Cameron at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. about is uh, you changing. But about a week after surgery, I went into a very, very, very deep depression. Surgery. Well, Ray, I'll tell you what. My heart surgery went according to plan. Hey, he's a pussycat. They went to do this again. They basically kill him for a split second. They're going to do this because it's got to be satisfied. Don't ponder and worry. It's wasted energy. It doesn't help. If it happens, it happens. There's nothing you can do. And the risks, uh, at least with our experience, have been extremely low. Um, Maybe your aorta will stay whatever the size it is, and you'll live your life till your grand old age.
Over a week had passed since the echocardiogram, and I checked the mail every day, awaiting the results. Several days went by, but still no letter. I asked Judy to check with our family physician when she received her allergy shots. He was the one who would be sending me the cardiologist's well, report. Hopefully she will be able to find out something. He personally picks these up himself at the hospital. He picks them up himself? Yes, and so he didn't pick it up till later that, that week. They don't fax them? No. What does it say? So uh, that's why you, it, it's probably in the mail. You'll probably get it tomorrow, his report. But he gave me a copy, is... and it says that it's 4.6 centimeters. Oh, wow, okay. So it stayed. It stayed. Okay. okay. Well, hopefully you also stay like that for a, ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Okay, so okay. so it's you can look at this. It's it's So we have a happy ending so far? For another six months. Okay, great. Thank you, honey. It didn't take me long to realize that others were handed a worse hand of cards than I was. I read in our local paper that a young man had just passed away from complications from chemotherapy and radiation. He was just twenty-eight years old and had a malignant brain tumor removed. It turned out to be the husband of a veterinarian whose wedding I had videotaped just two years ago. The news about my heart gave me pause and a sense of relief. Like my friend Tom dealing with his prostate cancer, I felt I could continue doing what I loved, unimpeded for at least another six months. It took me a while to realize that maybe my real fear was the thought of undergoing such an operation. I remember how deathly gray my son Rich looked when he was wheeled out of emergency surgery. And since meeting with Dr. Cameron, I wondered if I should wait until my aorta measured 5.5 centimeters, as is normally the case before electing surgery. I wanted to enjoy my life now. In February, Carl and I went on another road trip, this time to Ocracoke Island, North Carolina. When camping in the Outer Banks the previous April, we came across a CD from a local musical group called Coyote. We loved the music and the voice of Marcy Brenner. It turned out that Marcy was a cancer survivor and had her own personal story to tell. So we began work on another film, this one called Dead Girl Walking. his face.